Hi, welcome to the ShareSite channel. We have a new report called the Drawdown Risk Report, which measures a portfolio's downside risk. We'll go through this report in a two-part video series. In this video, we'll talk about two tools in the report, the maximum drawdown and the return over maximum drawdown. What do these metrics do? and how do we interpret them. This video also has chapters, so feel free to skip to the section that you like to watch. In the second video, we will show you how to run the report and a few scenarios on how to use it. You can find the link to the second videos in the description box below. Before we begin, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Follow us on our social media at ShareSite so you don't miss out on any product updates. This video is for informational purposes only. It does not constitute a specific product recommendation, taxation or financial advice. Always consult with your advisor or accountant to obtain the correct advice for your situation. Okay, so what is maximum drawdown? The maximum drawdown calculates an investment's downside risk. It compares the percentage loss from the highest price to the lowest price. I'll use a stock's weekly price movement as an example. Imagine a stock trades at $100 on Monday, goes up to $120 on Tuesday, drops to $80 on Wednesday, and then goes back to $100 the day after before ending the week at $90. Over this one week, the highest closing price was $120 on Tuesday and the lowest price was $80 on Wednesday, or a difference of $40. So the maximum loss over this five-day period is 33%, which is the $40 divided by the $120. The stock lost about a third of its value from the peak before it recovered. Why do you want to know what is the biggest loss? There are three reasons. The first one is you can visualize the worst case scenario. The maximum drawdown shows you the largest percentage drop. That means you'll be more prepared and less likely to panic in a market downturn. The second one is you can use it to stress test your portfolio. The maximum drawdown tells you how your investment might do under extreme market conditions. That means you can use this insight to size your positions according to your risk tolerance. The last reason is you can use the max drawdown to compare investment strategies. You understand how each strategies complement one another or how two similar strategies perform under stress. This helps you to create an ideal portfolio strategies that increases your risk-adjusted return. What is the limitation of maximum drawdowns? As with any tools, while maximum drawdown is useful to assess risk, it has limitations. Here are the three things to keep in mind when you use it. The first one is max drawdown only tells you what happened in the past. The future may or may not resemble the past. A 20% max drawdown doesn't mean that the 20% will be the biggest percentage drop in the foreseeable future. The second one is max drawdown doesn't tell you the volatility. Let's say you have two investments, A and B, both have a 10% max drawdown. Investment A, besides a 10% drop during a market crisis, its daily price change is stable, moving less than 1%. Whereas for investment B, its price changes between 5 to 10% every day. So despite both having the same max drawdown, investment B is more volatile than investment A. Max drawdown doesn't tell you that information. Max drawdown also doesn't tell you how long the drawdown and recovery is. Again, using the previous example, both investments A and B have a 10% max drawdown. Their prices went from $100 to $90 before it went back to $100. It takes a month for investment A to get to $90 and another month to recover. So two months in total, a month of drawdown followed by a month of recovery. For investment B, both the drawdown and recovery period lasted a year. So despite both having the same maximum drawdown, it takes longer for investment B to recover than investment A. You should use max drawdown together with other risk measurement tools to get a full picture of your investment's risk. The second tool in the risk report 
is the return over maximum drawdown or ROMAT for short. Return over maximum drawdown or ROMAT tells you an investment's risk-adjusted performance. It compares the return of an investment to its maximum drawdown. For example, if an investment's annualized return is 20% and the maximum drawdown is 10%, the ROMAT is 2. If the investment's annualized return is 25% and the max drawdown is 50%, the raw mat is 0.5. So the formula is the annualized return divided by the maximum drawdown. The raw mat tells you how much return you are getting for each unit of risk. So all else being equal, a higher raw mat is better than a lower raw mat. There are two ways to produce a high raw mat and investments can produce a high return with an average maximum drawdown or it can produce an average return but a very low max drawdown or a combination of high return or low max drawdown to produce a high ROMAT. Why is ROMAT useful? ROMAT shows you the risk-adjusted return for each investment. It tells you how much return am I getting for each unit of risk and how does that compare to other investments? A question that you might ask is what is a good roadmap? So you can decide whether you need to take any actions, whether that's for an investment or a portfolio. So before we get into what is considered as a good roadmap, there are two things that affect roadmap. The first one is time. The longer the time frame, the higher the maximum drawdown. The reason is that it is more likely to have a bear market in a longer period than a shorter period. An investment return also get normalized in the long term. This means a portfolio or investment romance tends to get lower as the time frame extends. The second one is investment style. Your investment style affects how you analyze investments. If your portfolio is more momentum or growth oriented, a high romance is a good thing. Whereas from a value investing point of view, a high roadmap means high market expectation, which means a high chance of a big loss if an investment fails to deliver. While a low roadmap is generally negative, it can also mean an investment is undervalued, which means there's a chance that it might outperform in the future. These two reasons are why roadmap doesn't tell you the full picture. It is important to consider the market expectation time frame and investment style when analyzing the number. Having said this, there are three methods that you can use to measure your portfolio. The first method is the baseline measurement. This measurement categorizes roadmap performance for a conservative portfolio into three levels. A roadmap above two is considered excellent because the investment generates returns that is significantly higher than the maximum risk. A roadmap between 1 and 2 is considered as average to good and the logic here is the investment return should at least be the same as the risk that you take and anything below 1 is considered as poor. The second method is the market benchmark. This uses an index ETF or an index funds for comparison. Here are a few examples. The return here is based on CAGR or compounded annual growth rates. And you can see here the 10-year roadmap for these index funds or index ETFs are somewhere between 0.2 to 0.5. The last one is directional measure, which means instead of focusing on what is a good or bad roadmap, you focus on improving it. So for example, if your portfolio roadmap for last year was 0.5, and it currently sits at 0.6, that is a good improvement because it is moving in the right directions. This concludes the part one of the two-part video series for the Drawdown Risk Report. If you like this video, don't forget to like and feel free to ask us any questions that you have. If you'd like to watch the demo of the Drawdown Risk Report in ShareSite and learn more about the use cases, the link to the part two is in the description box. We'll see you in the next video.